Hi, my name's Emma. I'm the B2B marketing manager here at Code First Girls, and this is Represent. Code First Girls exists to provide education opportunities to women and non-binary people who are wanting to learn to code for free before placing them in their first role in technology. Represent was started with the idea of providing our community with role models of people who are absolutely smashing it in the world of technology. So I'm delighted to be joined by Karen Brown, the Deputy CTO of Sainsbury's. Hi, Karen. Hi, Emma. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. It's, it's not a problem at all. It's an absolute pleasure to be here today and a pleasure to work with Code First Girls and also to talk about Represent. Absolutely. In our podcast studio. I know. This is amazing. It's this really is good. so good. So, Deputy CTO of Sainsbury's, yeah. talk me through a general day in the life. Uh, I suppose, like most people would say at this point, really varied. You know, completely a variety of topics and a variety of activities throughout the day. So, I lead a whole set of engineering teams that look after supply chain, logistics, finance, and controls within tech. But also, as part of the Deputy CTO role, we can be working on tech strategy, we can be talking on people strategy, finance controls, anything really around how we run the brilliant tech function that we have at Sainsbury's. But a big part of my role is about partnering, so partnering with stakeholders, partnering with the representatives of our customer base, how are we improving the technology that we provide, the customers that we serve, the colleagues that we work with, and how are we really making the best use of that technology that we've got within Sainsbury's. Amazing. And you were saying just this morning you were with a group of 300 of you. And yeah. is that the full size of the tech team? or? Oh, no, definitely not. So, you know, the tech team, including our partners, is in the thousands. Wow. Uh, you know, we have a huge tech team. Uh, my team uh, today was just the onshore team and just the team that are represented by our permanent colleagues. But we also partner with uh, other, other third parties to make sure that we've got the right capabilities across our tech teams. So circa 2,000 or more uh, across Sainsbury's Tech. Crikey. So, very busy. Very busy. How do you unwind then at the end of a long day? Uh, I, think, I think it varies. You know, I, I, I love to kind of switch off, go downstairs, cook the dinner, you know, put some you know, guilty pleasure TV on, uh, or to do something completely different with friends and go out. I'm a big socialiser, big social event organiser, probably the, the person in my group that does all of that organising, to be honest. Um, but if you take me in the summer, then I'll be in the dog in the car, out down the beach. Uh, very lucky to live near the coast. So, you know, we'll always try and uh, sort of get outside and spend some time fishing chips in the sand, maybe a dip in the summer in the sea and sort of get away from the devices and the uh, immediacy of work. You have to, right? I think that if yeah. you've got the seaside there, if you've got your dog there, a bit of... Um, like you say, you're practically the social sec of Sainsbury's <laughs> as well as the <laughs> deputy CTO. Well, definitely in my friend, friendship group, <laughs> definitely the social secretary. Um, and like many people, got friendship groups from across the years, I think, as well as work colleagues that are friends. So, you know, I think you have to have that mix, don't you, of trying to sort of spend the right time in work and get that balance outside as well. Absolutely. And you've been at Sainsbury's for 31 years. Yeah, 32 years in September. Wow, congratulations. That's yeah, pretty long impressive. Time. So, I mean, what has it been like working for an organisation over the majority of your career? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm super lucky, and I always answer this question exactly by starting with that word, I am lucky. I'm really blessed, actually, because I've managed to fulfil a career within the same organisation across such a different span of areas. So my background is not in tech, and I'm really proud of that, but proud now that I work in tech and I represent lots of brilliant women that work in tech as well. Because I started off in retail, I started off putting jam in donuts. And, and that's the phrase that I always use with people, which always makes people smile. But that was the first job I had. I was studying for my A-levels. I was earning money part-time to fund my, my A-levels and to fund studying to think about going to university and actually got a bit of a retail bug, if I'm honest. Managed to persuade my dad that I was gonna sort of take a year's break and then go to university, but actually managed to stay at Sainsbury's and spent 18 years in our retail team and then came into the store sports center in 2009. And as part of my kind of immersion into our store sports center, I suddenly learned around all these different parts of the business that existed and partnered really heavily with tech in those early days of my first role around in, uh, sort of providing operational efficiency, changing the way we managed our stores, process simplification. And as part of that, we were implementing self-checkouts for the first time in the UK, things that we now take for granted, you know, that ability to be able to check out really quickly. 
We're putting in handsets for grocers online picking and really changing the way that our tech was used in our stores for customers and for colleagues. And I got a bit of the bug, let's be honest, really curious about technology, curious about the changes in the innovation that it can create, the efficiency optimization. And then I started to transfer to a role in tech. And then I spent three and a half years keeping the lights on in service operations. And that was a baptism of fire. I can honestly say that was one of the most exciting jobs I've ever had but also the one that kept me awake at night because we do have service issues in a big organisation that happen and technology isn't fallible, as we all know. But actually, it was a big learning curve for me. You know, what is infrastructure? What are networks? How do these things all fit together? What, what does end-to-end -end technology really look like? And in those days, you know, it was very much about trying to know enough to be able to lead big teams, but also to not become the technical expert, to really develop my leadership skills and the, the breadth of those skills, working with onshore teams, offshore teams, 24-7 clocks, all those other things that come with leading those sorts of roles. I'd get out of bed in the morning with a spring in my step, let's be honest. My team would say I'm quite relentless. Um, and that is because I love being at work. And I can genuinely say I love being at Sainsbury's after 32 years. And I think I'm very lucky to say that. Yeah, absolutely. And so you were talking there about you know, the early days of the technology coming through. What is it that you're working on that you're the most excited about as far as oh. technology is concerned and the way that shopping at Sainsbury's is perhaps going to change massively in the next 10 years? Yeah, I mean, I think there are so many things going on at Sainsbury's which are super exciting. Um, but robots. I think you know, Robots. So I was about to, you know, that's literally uh, one I was about to quote. But, you know, we're, we're in the moment of really starting to think about what future-facing technology looks like. So you can think about robotics that we're trialling in our logistics space at the moment. You can think about AGVs, which we're trialling in logistics. Work in a way that really is quite collaborative and quite innovative in the way that we develop our technologies. And we've got great business partners. You know, we've got business partners that have got a strategy, got a vision, want to show up for customers brilliantly. So, you know, I think we're super lucky in that sense to be able to think innovatively about the technology that we're delivering. And were you always a kid that was super interested in technology? No. Really? No, not at all. Not Were at all. you really good with computers when you first started out? No, I didn't grow up in that sort of innovative age that I think now, you know, the younger generation of either blessed or cursed, depending on how you see technology, um, you know, that demand that it drives now for us for immediacy and for connectivity, I think can be a burden as well as a blessing, let's be honest. But, you know, I didn't have that, but I did have this thrive to learn and I also have this passion for simplicity, for efficiency, for creativity, for innovation, for people to be able to explore that. And I think for people to be able to use technology how they want to use it, when they want to use it. Who would say you can go from putting jam in donuts, running stores in Sainsbury's, to working on big organisational change and simplification programmes, to keeping the lights on 24-7 in tech, to managing principal risks and uncertainties in a corporation like Sainsbury's, to all of a sudden you know, leading transformation programmes and being a deputy CTO. I mean, that's just a little bit squiggly. You know, we talk about squiggly careers, don't we? We talk about that kind of non-traditional career path. I, I never would have said that. My dad to this day, my dad's 84, makes me laugh all the time just because he can use an iPhone better than me. So if we want to learn about you know, the immersion in technology, my dad is that, that role model. We'll have him on next. Yeah, so. he would be good on the podcast. He would think this is fascinating. Um, I'd love to be sat here chatting with you all. Um, <laughs> but you know, there's definitely something about how we use that curiosity to not limit ourselves, to mm -hmm. not think that our career is limited. My career is about being great with people, curious to learn, really being passionate about delivery and about making it better for people. And we have some values at Sainsbury's that I think really suit my personality. So that cultural fit of where you work is really important. I think you'd say the same about working at Code First Girls, your passion, the team's passion for Code First Girls is why you work here. Mm. You know, and it absolutely is super important, I think, to have that affinity to the culture of an organization, the values that it has. You know, we have three very simple values in Sainsbury's. Be human, make it better, and own it. And that probably sums Karen up. That's probably what my dad would say about me. <laughs> you know, my dad would say, that's what you do every day, Karen. You're really human, you make it better, and if, if you've got something to do, you'll just own it and do it. 
And I think that's really important. You're totally right. You know, you've had many careers, many careers within your time at Sainsbury's. And a huge proportion of our community are career yeah. switches. But how do you know when it's right to leave a job and choose something new? Um, I think there's a, there's a few indicators, I think, that you kind of, if you really are in touch with yourself and that self-awareness piece, you know, I spend a lot of time mentoring people or working with people during their career development. And I spend a lot of time saying to people, how do you know what your strengths really are? How do you know what actually you should be making stronger every day? And we all have opportunities for development, but you're probably going to move those inches rather than miles in your whole career path. People will say, since the day that I started in my career, I talk too fast. You'll know this on this podcast. But absolutely... Have I tried to change that over the years? Yes. Do I really make a conscious effort sometimes? Yes. But am I fundamentally shifting that? No. So there is something about knowing yourself really, really well, knowing what makes you happy, because I think you have to be happy at work. You have to enjoy it. And I think if you know what those things are, then when that starts to feel a little bit less comfortable, you feel a little bit less motivated, things feel harder. And I don't just mean the work's hard. I mean, your own personal motivation, satisfaction, the, the drive and desire that you have to do that job starts to dwindle or it starts to feel a little bit repetitive, then I think you need to think about what the next change is. And that doesn't mean changing companies, maybe. That can be switching careers within a company like mine if there's an opportunity. Or it can be that you need to switch. Mm. And that's okay. Mm. You just need to find the right place to go. And as we said earlier make sure that the choice is yours as well as choice of the organisation that you want to join. And I think that is very much about finding people to talk to about that, you know, using your network around you, someone that you feel can give you advice and that advice can come from multiple different places and kind of say, should I? Is this the right time? What should I? This is what I'm thinking. How does that feel? Does it feel like this is the right thing to do? And then I think go for it because I think we worry too much about what does the CV look like? But I think when I interview people or when I look at CVs, and we all do it, don't we? We sift CVs all the time, and people worry about, I have to have, to have done a role for a year, or I have to have had that on my, on my CV for two years. Why? Just tell me you made that choice for this reason, and then you didn't like it. And actually, this is why it didn't fit. It didn't fit because culturally it wasn't the right organisation, or the work wasn't what you thought it was going to be, or the people that you thought we were going to be working with weren't the people you thought you were, you were going to be working with. And that's okay, isn't it? Because I need to be able to flourish. I need to mm. be able to fulfill my potential. And I can only do that if I'm happy. I can only do that if I'm in the right space. 100% such good advice. And a lot of our community are tech returners as well. So people who, like yourself, were doing a tech role have gone away and come back to it. Or perhaps they're people yeah. who are coming back off paternity, maternity leave. Yeah. Um, so... You know, what advice do you have for our community that, for whatever reason, might have taken a long extended period of time away from technology and are coming back to it? Come back. <laughs> First thing, come back. Please come we back. We need you. We need you. <laughs> um, but secondly, you know, I think you come back with a very different perspective. You know, you come back with whatever you've been doing in that interim period of time. You come back with a learning, you come back with a whole different set of skills that you didn't have the first time. And you've had the chance to reflect upon that experience. And I think back to my first experience in technology. And I think I was, you know, in some ways trying to prove myself, you know, because I wasn't the technologist, because I didn't un deeply understand technology. And I think with that came a different level of behavior sometimes from me, probably, and experience interacting with me that was maybe not the experience you'd get from interacting with me this time around. Mm. Because I think I'm more comfortable in my own skin now. I'm more comfortable that I don't need to be the expert. I'm more comfortable that I can lean on other people more and be more open and ask more curious questions and say, I'm not the expert and that's okay because that's why you're here. That's why you're brilliant in your role and celebrate that success. And I also think in the interim period of my first role in technology and the second role, what I also seeked to understand and spent a lot of time and still spend a lot of time doing because I've only ever worked at Sainsbury's let's be honest is seeking that external support and clarity that helps me every day I have a brilliant network of people that I talk to a lot you know and they've got brilliant experiences in the organizations they work with now 
but also actually in organisations they worked in previously, roles they've done, and they help. You know, they help put things in perspective. I bounce ideas off them. I've had brilliant mentors, brilliant coaches, you know, brilliant conversations. And I think that that really helps. So I think whether you've taken a career break, whether you've taken a, a career break for, you know, other caring responsibilities, to bring up a family, to go and work somewhere else, and actually you've been with a charity partner, or just to take another role, that's great because all of that learning that you've had, you're bringing back to the role that you do now. And that doesn't have to be technical skills. We can all learn technical skills. They are within our gift. It's just about the time that you devote to them. What you can bring in bucket loads is that life experience. And don't underestimate that. The perspectives and the variety of perspectives is what makes up a, you know, a team whole. We can't all be the same. And I talk about that all the time because if you've got people that are all just the same, you've got no representation. You know, so let's go back to represent. You know, we want to have representation. We want to have diversity of thought. We want to have diversity of experience. We want to have choices. That only comes with the richness of brilliant conversations and the people that are sat around the table. So don't underestimate the skills that you've got, even if you haven't been in work and taken a career break, or even if you've done something different that wasn't maybe the career path that you've thought. Just think about how you bring that to the party now. That's great, great advice. But what else can people do to help best prepare them if they are jumping back into tech? I, th I think there's so much available now. You know, I think so, you know, if you think about social media, if you think about the ability to join meetups, to go to different events, you don't have to be in work, you don't have to be as part of an organisation that maybe is a career path that you want to have to join some of these things. And I think it's super important to do that at a pace that suits you and do that in a way that suits you. So it could be that you start to follow people on LinkedIn or on TikTok or on other social media platforms that you're comfortable using, Emma. Um, but it could be that you, you know, that you want to just start to connect with people that maybe you worked with before or maybe people that you went to college or university with that have taken different career paths and just start to think about and learn you know, what those opportunities could look like. I don't think there's anything wrong with reading, taking up opportunities to study online, taking opportunities to be curious about exploring, you know, podcasts and social media platforms, because they're where we get all of our brilliant ideas, surely. They're where we get all of our brilliant curiosity and uh, impassionate learning that we can take into the way that we want to take our careers forward going forward, or even just our life choices. So, I, again, don't think just limit yourself. I think just spend whatever time you've got in a way that suits you. Some people love to be more visual and watch YouTube videos or you know, watch different uh, podcasts that are also broadcast as, as video events. Some people want to read. Some people want to immerse themselves in great documentation and books and theory. That's brilliant. Some people want to meet human beings and interact and have conversations. So make your choices. I think the only thing I'd say is be brave. You know, just make one or two of those things happen every week, every month, whatever suits your diary and your other commitments. And I think all of a sudden there'll be a momentum that starts to get created. You'll be motivated by other people. People will drag you along or you'll want to read the next book or you'll want to see the next podcast and listen because you'll be curious about who the next guest is. And I think that's okay. So I, I would just say try a little bit to put yourself out there and you'll be surprised. Scary though. Very scary. Especially if you've been out for a little yeah, while. Yeah, and I think the imposter syndrome kicks in, let's be honest. Yeah. I don't, and I don't think that's a, that's a gender thing, let's be honest. I don't think that... And I talk to lots of men that also suffer from imposter syndrome. Oh, 100%. So, so I think there's, there's definitely something about using people around you and saying, I'm scared. Hand up. Demonstrating vulnerability and not being afraid to demonstrate vulnerability. You know, I am a crier. You know, you can watch the Jess Hall podcast on Represent if you haven't watched that. Jess says the same thing. Uh, I used to work with Jess. We used to cry together. You know, so I think there's nothing wrong with saying that. You know, there's nothing wrong with saying I'm nearly 50 years old. And Katie, who's here in the background, would have already seen me cry. And I cry. And that, that's okay, because I care. And I think it's okay to show that you care sometimes. Absolutely. Well, we've spoken so much about your career. Mm -hmm. But if I put you in a time machine, oh, and we were this going, is the hardest question. going back in time. It's one of the questions from our community. We've got to answer it. Tough community. So if you were going back in time, what career would you like to relive I think you know in terms of where would I have loved my career to take and yeah. therefore what type of career would I have liked I would have loved to have been a lawyer really curious about justice 
you know, really curious about a making judge, sure. Be a judge then. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, Maybe not. It's, 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 well, don't get me wrong. You know, there is a bit about being a judge, but I think you're past the point of representation. You're at the point of decision. Mm, and I think that's, that's a lot. little bit different than being the representative and choosing, actually, yeah. who you want to, you know, have a bit of a, a legacy career about. Who do you mm -hmm. want to represent? Do you want to represent, you know, different types of criminals or non-criminals do you want to do you know, represent the innocent or the guilty do you mm. want to do that defense or that prosecution piece so I think there's definitely something in that kind of legal background that's always made me curious because I have a sense of right or wrong and I think you know going back to kind of what makes you who you are in your career there is something about personal values there's something about doing things that aligns with your personality as well and those personal values that probably come from upbringing probably come from the way that you've been immersed into life in general. So, you know, there are people that inspire me that have had those sorts of careers. You know, you can definitely go to uh, Nick Clegg's wife, who if any of you haven't Googled Nick Clegg's, Clegg's wife, uh, Miranda, you definitely should do that. There's definitely something about the Amal Cloonies of the world. Oh, Beautiful, tell me about it. absolutely, as well as stunningly intelligent and yeah. amazing uh, career history. Yeah. Understanding what makes you happy mm just is so much more important yeah. than any job title that you think might look yeah. impressive on your LinkedIn, because all of that stuff wears off. And at the end of the day, when it all boils down, it's you, you're the one that has to get up and mm. go to work on a Monday morning. Mm. And if that job is to make somebody else happy or for the facade of looking important, it doesn't matter. No, and it's a great, it's a great build actually, because in lots of roles in my career, I've moved sideways. And people often say to me, you know, why have you not like sort of pushed for promotion earlier? Or why are you not going for that job over there? Or why are you not driving for that name on the CV of the next, the next promotion? And I'm, I'm not really motivated by that. I've never been motivated by that. I don't really care what my job title is, to be honest. You know, I don't really mind what it says on the CV. I'm not really worried about what it says on LinkedIn. I'm more worried about and really passionate about, do I love coming to work? You know, does it make me happy? Do I feel like I'm adding value? Do I feel like the people I'm working with want to work with me? You know, do I feel like they're getting something from their career by working with me and you know, by me working with them? And I think it's so important because I think you can feel the pressure, can't you? you know, feel the pressure of your friends or your family members that are like, no, you need to be at this stage by this age. The life plan, what's your life plan? I don't know what my life plan is. I still don't know what my life plan is. I'm nearly 50. So someone needs to tell me if I need to have a life plan for the rest of my late yeah, years. <laughs> but, you know, I think it is so important to make sure that you are really thinking about what makes you happy. 100%. Um, so one question that our community wants to know is if you could read one book again for the first time, what would it be? This is the easiest question. I'm so glad you asked this question because this is the easiest question. Uh, so many people that are watching the podcast and maybe yourself will have read this book but because it's often part of a school curriculum. Um, but I would have loved to have read this book now with the knowledge that I have all the years later. Uh, so it would be To Kill a Mockingbird uh, by Harper Lee. Um, and I think it's just because when you read that book as a child, let's be honest, you necessarily don't have the insight or the understanding of the world that actually was operating at that time and the whole racial injustice innocence destruction you know or we go back to that kind of moment in that book where where you read some of those quotes and the representation of Atticus Finch let's be honest as a white male at that time standing up and representing minorities and gender in a world where Equality didn't exist, equity didn't exist. So um, I read that book a lot and my husband laughs at me when I get this book out um, because there are three books on my shelf from my childhood uh, that I still read a lot for different reasons. But it is the one that every time I read it, I wish I would be able to read it again with the understanding that I have now of the world. Have you seen it at the theatre? I've seen it at the theatre, twice. So have I. No, I so have I. I watched it once, and then, I'm really sorry, I actually haven't told my best friend this, but she bought it for my birthday. The week did you after. pretend? Yeah, I did. She still doesn't know. <laughs> but she does now. 
sorry, anyway. All these things come out in the truth eventually. But there's nothing it's wrong amazing. with that, is there? No, and I actually preferred it the second time, and it's such an incredible story. Yeah, yeah. If you haven't and been to right, the theatre, it's wasted on the young. It's wasted when you read it in GCSE. Well, I think the re the the benefit of reading it at GCSE, I think, is that when you do understand these things and you do do more exploration later in life, don't you? Because I think that comes with a different perspective and meeting different people and interacting in different organisations, social as well as uh, from a work perspective. And I think what you do then is go back to those types of books and go, oh, now I get it. Oh, now I understand. Now I see that through a different lens. And I think that's the benefit of reading it when you're young because the innocence actually helps you understand the story. Whereas later in life, with a bit more perspective, that's when you can understand the real context of the book. What a great answer. I knew you were going to say that when you were talking about being a lawyer. I knew it. <laughs> yeah, that was probably, that was probably a bit of a hint, actually. I hadn't really made the connection. It was probably a bit of a hint. Yeah, yeah. maybe that sort of sowed the seeds mm, early maybe. on. If you had one word oh. for your younger self, what would that be? It is two words. Is that yeah, okay? That's totally fine. Sentence, as many as you need. Just two. Don't worry. I think I spent a lot of time in my early career and probably sometimes in my latter career and even on occasion now, let's be honest about admitting uh, when we're not perfect, when sometimes I worry about the, the little things, not the big things. You know, in my early career, I'd worry about what do people think? You know, what, do they think that because I don't come from a, a university background that I don't have a level of intellectual capability? I used to worry that they would think that I don't sound uh, articulate enough or intelligent enough in certain meetings and forums. I'd worry about what people think about me. You know, I'd worry that if I made a mistake, that that's it, my career's over, crossed off the list, you know, no development or career path for Karen. I, I worry in the last few years about being called Karen. Let's be honest, there's lots of mems out there about being called Karen. I'm like, <laughs> oh my God, do I need to change my name? You know, is that now part of the world? So, you know, I worry about things that take a lot of energy. You know, they, they sap you, don't they? They're mm. exhausting. So the one thing I would say to myself in my early career, and even now, is just don't worry. It, it doesn't matter. Your life will be okay. You'll go through ups and downs and all those life experiences, personal and professional, but it will be a brilliant life because that's what it's meant to be and that's how you make it a brilliant life. So, you know, I always talk about, if you look to any of my social media pages, they say no regrets. So have no regrets and just don't worry. Live life the way you want to live it. And they always say something like 2% of what you actually worry about ever comes oh, true anyway. Exactly. So it's, half the time it's not going to happen. And all those sleepless nights are just not good for you, let's be honest. Yeah, you need that sleep. You need sleep at the most important thing. Uh, so sleep more and sleep don't worry. Sleep more and don't worry. <laughs> Oh, Karen, thank you so much for being our first interviewee oh. in the new studio. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. And I know our community will be very grateful to having heard your story. So thanks so much. No, Emma, thank you. That was amazing.